is up to the transparency? Welcome, home team, moderators, subscribers, members, all the new OG members, or I'm sorry, all the new members plus the OG members. When you mix it all together, that makes the home team recipe. Once you go home team, you don't go back. Um, <clears throat> good morning. Well, mm -mm -mm. Um, as I am gathering all my in, intel information for an amazing documentary with all of the Idaho Four stuff and the Idaho, uh, the state of Idaho versus Moore, um, you, go, you get to come across people and interview them. And um, I had an interview last night with one of Bonner's Ferry's uh, longest standing massage therapists. Ooh la la. Mwah. So, <clears throat> mm. so yeah. But now we're back here, and this is live, and this is happening right in front of you guys. And uh, what I'm going to show you is first a boom, and then we're going to get into, uh, because <clears throat> I'm getting through some of the read sessions with you guys, so that you actually have a really good feel for this investigation that took place um, because it's as lifelike as you could imagine for the Idaho 4 case because everybody's been following that case. Um, the Idaho 4 case and Dr. Moore, Dr. Break, uh, Drake's case, it was handled by the same ISP officers. That's why I'm doing this. Also, when I came across it, I was like, whoa. Um, you know, why are you going after this, you know, Dr. Moore guy? I mean, it was just that obvious. It was not him. But <clears throat> so again, but we're going to start off with this bang, boom, because I was able to find where Tolson, ISP Detective Tolson, says it and says that, well, the eyewitness describes Caleb, who was the last patient. Like that's who he describes seeing. Tolson knows this. He says he gives like an exact description of the ukulele player that was seen last with uh, Dr. Moore. That's the description that. Um, the eyewitness gives. And this is exculpatory for Dr. Moore. And he tells Jennifer Drake flat out in an interview that is recorded, transcribed, and put in and put in paperwork, but left out of obviously the probable cause to arrest Dr. Moore. And was left out and turning over exculpatory evidence to for the indictment of Dr. Moore. <clears throat> Ready? Take a look at this. I'm pulling this up for you guys. Hi, chat. While we wait for that, if you guys could hit the thumbs up, that would be amazing. You can get right back into it. Hope everyone's doing good this morning, afternoon. Get your hump day in. We're almost through the week. She's about to pull it up. Mm -hmm. Jokey, jokey. Let's go like this. Hmm. Honk, honk. Again, hi, everybody. Let's pull it up like this. I'm going to go in a different way. 
You're going in the back end. Yeah, I'm going through the back channels over here. Oh my gosh. Like back channel, Betty. Back and back. Okay, yeah, here it is. That's what I want. Hmm. Hmm. Actually, <laughs> scratch that. You idea. could just Hector it too. I, I know could Hector way. it, but you know. Hector's off. Yeah, because Hector's going to be super busy later. Oh my gosh, Hector. Things I make Hector do. I do apologize. I'm so on backlog with my emails since vacation. So, um, but yeah. Okay, here we are. Let me share this. Got it. All right, take a look at this. Ready? Detective Sergeant Van Leuven. He yells across the street when he sees the guy walking out of there. He says, hey, was that you? The guy turns and looks, and then he describes Kia. Kikoa, which is Caleb's middle name. He describes dark clothing. He even describes that the silver vest kind of thing, which he was wearing. He describes the heavy features, but he can't pick him out of a lineup. So for us, the best we can do is point. So for us, the best he can do is point us in the direction. We don't have any motive why Kikoa Caleb would do this. That's right. Yeah. So that's there's that's something we're going to look into. Yeah. And it's interesting that several different friends and family have mentioned to us that they thought the video, one person said the video made the hair on the back of her neck stand up when she watched it. She thought it was odd. But anyways, so we'll follow up with that. Right here, Detective Sergeant Van Leeuwen, he describes this man to a T and they leave it out. You can't make this up, guys. You just can't, okay? It's flat out disgusting. Flat out sick. And um, and them's the facts, okay? It's right here. <clears throat> Again. He yells across the street when he sees the guy walking out of there. He says, hey, was that you? The guy turns and looks, and then he describes Kakoa, which is Caleb, um, the guy from Hawaii, there with his sister, Aldora. These are the people that got squeezed in where Dr. Drake texted them back at 3 p.m. that day and said, okay, yeah, come at 6. He describes dark clothing. He even describes that silver vest kind of thing, which he was wearing. Oh, he knows that that's what he was wearing. Oh, my God. He said that he looked like he was somebody working at the gas station at, like, the pump. Like, because it was like a car. It, it was like a silver, like a, um, but he's right here. The detective knows this. The sergeant, the guy in charge. He describes the heavy features being how he was dark complected. But he can't pick him out of a lineup. Well, did you even put him in the lineup? Did you get a picture of him and put him in the lineup? I would love to see the six pack that was given to Isaac to make this. Because they weren't given an, a lineup, the eyewitness, for weeks later, for the record. <clears throat> Again, then you're telling people. So then ISP goes out and they make a statement and they say that Dr. Moore was the person that was seen in this hoodie with the hood up, dark clothing. 
this is what ISP goes out and tells people. This is what Jennifer Drake went out and told people. Meanwhile, they knew that the eyewitness and the cameras and whatever they're saying, they knew that it wasn't this man, Dr. Moore. They knew all along on March 26, 2020, that the eyewitness had basically identified Caleb Kakoa. There's your boom. So it'd be the same as like Dylan or Bethany or anybody else that would be asked that, you know, here, we know that this is this person, but hey, guess what? We're just going to ignore this and flush that and try to hide that. They did it right here. This is proof. Maybe the cameras weren't not working after all. Maybe they were working, but they didn't help the case of to arrest Dr. Moore. So we're going to get back into it. Meredith Page, this is maddening. You're damn right, Meredith. You are damn straight right. It's 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 sick. It's hard for the Moors because think about being from a small town and being labeled and we know how town gossip goes, right? So how do you undo something like this? And um, that's where I don't think there's an undoing of this once the town gets a hold of this and rumors start. So here, check this out. Mm -mm -mm. Mm. I'll read it again there for George Washington, who's late to the party. <laughs> Detective Sergeant Van Leeuwen says in an interview with Jennifer, okay. Who's the? Who's the Jennifer Drake, the widow, widow of Brian Drake, on March 26th, tells her basically, you know, he yells across the street, speaking of Isaac, the one of the eyewitnesses, he yells across the street when he sees the guy walking out of there, out of there. He sees the guy walking out of there. Walking out of where? Out of where? Out of what? The building? Okay, because I thought that he was just shot through the window. So where would you be walking out of anything? You know, how could you see somebody walking out of where? The back of the building? Because you can't see that from where Isaac's apartment is. So he yells across the street when he sees the guy walking out of there. Isaac's building's across the street from Dr. Drake's, but Dr. Drake's is in the back. Isaac's has a very good view. If, if he was actually in his apartment, the guy turns and looks at him. And then he describes um, when this guy turns and looks at Isaac, he describes, and he says right here, he describes Kakoa and that's his middle name, Caleb Kakoa Nezalari. He describes dark clothing, even describes the silver vest kind of thing, which he was wearing. He describes the heavy features, but he can't pick him out of a lineup. Well, did you even put his picture in the lineup is my question. And when was this lineup given to him? So for us, the best thing he can do is point us in the direction, which means when Isaac said, well, he walked this way. Okay, because that's the man that he then ends up chasing down or tries to chase down in his car to take a picture of. Isaac does that, right? Isaac does that. And... So here, nothing of what looks like Dr. Moore, who's 63, white hair. Okay. And he's telling this all to Jennifer Drake, Sergeant Van Leuven. And who's Caleb Coco? Like Caleb Coco was the, the last, the last people to be seen by Dr. Drake. It was a squeeze and appointment. He went there with his sister, Eldora, who's been a patient of Dr. Drake's for six or seven years in Bonners Ferry. And she had texted him on Wednesday to say, hey, can you, feel, can you fit us in? No, I'm full. I'm booked. How about Monday? Because he's in Bonners on Mondays and Thursdays. So uh, she thought that she was going to be seeing him on Monday. Well, then Dr. Drake decides for whatever reason to text um, Eldora at 3 p.m. on Thursday and say, hey, if you actually want to come at six, I can squeeze you in. 
So then they arrive at 6.03 because she had done something with her phone while she was there. Um, and so she was walking in and they were sitting there when this Paul Jacobson guy was the previous appointment before that, the, the big, tall, six foot, six foot five, big gut guy that was angry or disgruntled. Or agitated. Yeah, agitated. Um, and so then, and when they arrived, they said that it was only the doctor's car and then they saw that truck. And then, so she parked next to the doctor's car. And then, um, you know, so then I said, well, the truck has to belong then to the, the Paul Jacobson guy, because how the hell did he get there from Coeur d'Alene? He didn't walk, you know? Um, so that truck that is parked wherever it was parked, um, that had to be Paul Jacobson's truck. Cause that was the only other vehicle that was in there that they said in their interviews. So, um, <clears throat> Um, so then that's, that, that's who the Caleb Kakoa guy is. And, um, let's go ahead and get back into, I mean, that's, you, you, you pretty much, it's right there. The, the sergeant knows that the eyewitness just identified a totally different man, not Dr. Moore, um, and puts that nowhere in the probable cause because that's totally not going to get Dr. Moore arrested, if you talk about this, um, and totally doesn't talk about, you know, any of these, um, these timestamps of when any of this was happening, you know, uh, puts in the probable cause that Jennifer called 911 and she's repeatedly telling them that she did not. She has her phone out in front of them at this interview and she is showing them that she, you know, what all her calls are. And they ask if she did it from a landline. And she says, I don't have a landline. Everything I do is on this phone. Does it seem like the last patient was the big burly guy? He was one of the last. He was, yeah, he was one of the last, um, according to, you know, but then see, according to Eldora, you know, when they had left, that truck was still there. So I think maybe he was waiting Okay, because when they walk out, they said, yeah, we saw we still saw the truck and it was in the drive through. So we couldn't leave that way. We had to go back out the back way because that truck was blocking to be able to to get in through the drive through between the two buildings. So they had to leave, you know, the other way. And that truck was still there. And that would be to me that that was Paul Jacobson's truck. So. Um, But we're going to get into all that shit. So this is like an onion. This case is like an onion. And as the layers get peeled back, there's more and more stuff that comes out. And you'll see that. And the reason it's important is because we want to understand what these ISP guys, you know, how do they run investigations? Because that's what Ann Taylor's big thing here is, is she's looking at all of this and she's like, how are you coming at Brian Kohlberger with everything that we see here, nothing is pointing to Brian Culverter, except for stuff that just makes no sense. You get what I'm saying? The Richard wants to know if this was in September, two years prior to Moscow. This was in Bonner's Ferry in 2020, two years prior. March. Yeah. Not September. Yeah, yeah. March, March, March 12, 2020. Dr. Moore got arrested in August, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm. We don't even know if Isaac knows this yet. So that's what we're we're working on is for everybody that was ever questioned, everybody's been just told what Jennifer's told them. And it's always a different story. Everybody has a different story. Mm. Like my conversation with a massage therapist last night. Um, she's like, yeah, Jennifer told me that there were two shots. That she heard and she heard that. Yeah, and that she heard two shots. Um, and that, you know, and that's the same thing that the uh, Isaac and his girlfriend Aaliyah said. It wasn't just one shot. It wasn't just one shot. So um, yeah, there's a ton of things that we're gonna that we're gonna show and prove. Which then the question is: is how in the world are detectives with with the actual facts? How are they able to hide these actual facts? And everybody wants to live and die by the PCA that was put out on Brian Culver. Well, if you actually look at that PCA, it's complete crap. Like, there is nothing in that PCA worth a damn. You guys do realize that, right? And that's what I'm trying to point out 
and, and going back and actually looking at this because at, at first it looked so good, didn't it? But when you actually break it down, break it apart, and now we have something to compare it to with the people that were also on that case with the with another case to see how they operate. Okay. And the amount of lies that are being told. No wonder why Mr. Gonsalves and Mrs. Gonsalves are so frustrated. Lord knows what they were told. So let's get into it. Yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> put our reading voices on yeah. and be very professional and not laugh. Okay. Now we get into the good juicy stuff. Um, you don't have your banner going. You should use the banner that you used yesterday. I could put my banner up. David Banner, David Banner. It's right here. There you go. David Banner, Banner, Oh, Banner, gee, Banner. right. There. Those of you guys that are joining in at work um, and you're listening in your cubicle. What a treat. I don't envy you. I think it's a treat because you just get to listen to a story. I know, but they have to work. What? Is that so hard to type something and you're listening to something else? So I give you guys so much credit. So here we go. Okay. Again, this interview is going to pick back up here. I'm <laughs> sitting here with... Uh, oh, explain for everybody. Gary Tolson, my partner here, and myself is uh, Detective Sergeant Van Leuven with the uh, Idaho State Police. All right, so uh, let's get back into it. And then I'm Jennifer Drake. Oh, yeah, I'm here with Jennifer Drake. The um, widow. The widow of Brian Drake. And sitting here with her is her mother. Cynthia. Miller. And her brother-in-law. Uh, Jonathan. Brian Drake's brother. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Did you have any life insurance policy on your husband? I did. How much is it for? It's for a million dollars. Four million? One million. Oh, one million. And when was that taken out? 2016. Who, who is that through? Mutual of Omaha. And whose idea was it to do that? Both of ours. We kept saying we wanted to do it, wanted to do it. It was actually Joshua Sprague was like, it's ridiculous. We just keep thinking we'd never need it. And so we just finally decided together we would do it. <clears throat> Did you get one for yourself as well? No, I didn't work. And I knew that if he lost me, it wasn't, it wasn't worth anything. That's, uh, I, that's a ridiculous statement. Not true. I, I know, but I just, he was a lot more valuable than I really, in the scheme of making sure that our kids were okay. Even that's not true. That's Jonathan that says, his brother says, even that's not right. Yes, that was, that was her brother. Thank you, John. <laughs> well, mostly that's true. I just, you know. I'll tell you, I have a policy on my wife. It would be very expensive to replace her. Well, that's amazing, actually, that we even have one because we went without one forever because we just thought we don't need one. It wasn't until Josh just kept saying you need to get one. OK, I'm thinking that we're going to give you a receipt, uh, have a receipt, sign receipt for the cash. OK, OK. And some of those receipts, some of this paperwork, we want to keep. Okay. Let's keep all the receipts for now. They're talking about his wallet, by the way. They give him, they give her the cash out of the wallet, which is $600. Okay. Then we're going to go ahead and give you the money. Okay. Okay. But I need you to sign a receipt for it. So I'll have one made up and everything else we're going to duplicate. And then we'll get it back to you when we can. Good. It won't be tomorrow. That's okay. Okay. I don't think I need them. If you need anything, just call me. And we can, at the very least, get a copy for you. None of that stuff is stuff that I need, though. From Was that like a chiropractic? I just know that we just dealt with his license and just want to make sure that it's not something that's time sensitive. I have no idea what's in this envelope. Oh, um, I need to pay... That's a bill that needs to be paid that he didn't drop off. 
Do you mind? If you want to go, if you want to go through this and see what there is and there's there's things that you need, then we can make copies of them. Right. Okay. And after we go through everything, we can potentially give you back everything. Well, you I know it's in here, so go ahead and open it. Sure. If you would for us, please. Yeah, it's just the check for his sandpoint office. Because it hasn't gone through the U.S. mail, I'm not worried. Yeah, I'm the one who wrote it. Okay. It's just the check that goes for his rent that was to be dropped off in Sandpoint. Let's just uh, make a copy of it and give her the check. Do you want to go through, is this the book that you're interested in as far as current activities? Yes. That's the stuff that, like, if he's needing me, I just do all the business side of it, and so... Why don't you go... All of his business stuff is in there. Why don't you go through and see if there's anything you need copies of, and we can do that right here and now. That would be great. Thank you. So these are all the things that have to do with patients' insurance. I mean, eventually, they're going to, be, they're going to need to be dealt with just because they're waiting for their policies and stuff. I could make copies. Um, patients to be paid. That's... Um, Um, okay. Oh, wait, that was my fault. Okay, it's this, sorry. Mm -hmm. Do you want to read We that? have a box full of documents here that came from his desk. Some some from in his desk, some from containers under his desk. Yeah, those are all of his. I mean, I so don't know what, if any of this is important to you. If it's older? If you would like to look through it, this bag by bag, okay. you're welcome to. I can do that afterwards. I'm just going to make copies of these and I'm going to give you these, okay? Like, do you have any idea how long you're going to have all of this? Are we talking weeks? Are we talking months? If you need it. Well, I have. We can, when, when you do a search warrant, you go to the court and you get an order preserving property. And so the court basically says, I order you to seize this if you find it at this place. And then after you seize it, so this is stuff that was seized from his office, by the way. We come back to the court and we say, court, we found these objects that we seized. And the court then issues an order for us to preserve the property at our uh, evidence area. So we kind of have to go back to the court and say, okay, court, we have to give these things away now and have the court agree to let us do that. So my only concern is that I don't know what I don't know. And some of those things are a lot of things that patients give to him. Sure. And he either takes care of them. Right. Or he passes them on. And so some of them he's taking care of when it comes to reports or things that have to be dealt with for patients to be paid. That's. I don't know. That's why. Uh, what is needed. That's why if you'd like to go through this paperwork right now, we can. Um, okay, I'll just... And you can see if there's anything. Do it after. It's, is that okay? I, if I, I think so. It might be a, a lengthy process for me to sit and go through all of it. I'm sorry. I'm just going to ask. Is it possible to do it perhaps next week? Thanks for asking, Jonathan. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's perfect. We, we need to get her through the... We have to get her through the, the funeral and, and maybe we... Can circle back to that. Absolutely. That's what that was what Jonathan was saying. Absolutely. Whenever is convenient for you is fine. Now see here in a search warrant, you have when you when you see something, you have so many days to turn it back over. You guys remember how we're reading all these search warrants and you have to do the inventory and when you get stuff and you put it in. So I'm curious in all of this because this was stuff that was seized in a search warrant. You get what I'm saying? Uh-huh. And they're just saying, Okay, here, just go through it and take whatever you want, or we'll make copies, or what's the deal here? Anyways, that's just very interesting. Moving on. <clears throat> uh, family, what about this? What about his family? Does he, you're his brother? And then uh, I'm John. one of his two brothers. And then, okay, and what's, how long have you guys been married? 21 years this June, 20 and a half. Okay, so Jonathan, brother, what's the name of other brother? Um, the brothers he gives up those names and there's a sister okay and you live where okay uh i live in germany in germany and what do you do 
uh, I'm, in a, I'm a military officer, air, army, force. Jonathan Drake says army. What is your rank? I'm a lieutenant colonel. One of the guys that is on my team is in the reserves, and he just got back from a year-long deployment to Guantanamo. Guantanamo, and he was promoted to major while he was down there. And I know that Ms. Potts is listening right now, and she's just losing her shit. <laughs> <laughs> Guantanamo. Guantanamo, baby. Um, then uh, Jonathan says, excellent. You know, so he was pretty excited about that. Yeah, that's great. And what about, you know, they asked about the other brothers and sisters. Um, and uh, one of them, you know, they go ahead and they talk about that. Um, is that where he lived in North Dakota? Well, no, actually he lives in South Carolina. Um, so they go on about talking about that. And they talk about then his sister. Uh, so... Where and, she lives. Where she lives. When she was born. Mm -hmm. How the ages of everybody. And so they get that out. <clears throat> and then, um, um, let's see. They ask about the parents. And they ask where they are at. And his parents are in Texas. So basically, like, Brian's family is, like, in every state scattered. Well, mainly they were in Texas, right? And then when they left Austin. Well, no, I'm talking about his family. Oh, his entire. Yeah, like his brothers and his sisters. So like we got Minnesota, we got South Carolina, we got Texas. So his family scattered across the United States. We got right? Germany. And we got Germany. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So then um, let me say, okay, here we get to this part, which is um, spoke with Chad. He spoke with Chad the most. They had a regular Thursday night phone call. And then Van Leeuwen says, okay. Um, that he confided the most in, yeah. So he's saying that he was supposed to talk to Chad that night, his brother, the other brother, yeah. Brian. Um, do you have their telephone number? So he's trying to get all their information. Chad is actually coming into town today. Okay. And he'll be here though, if you want. I can see if he'd be willing to sit down with you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's probably going to be a pretty brief conversation, but I just like to know if he said anything that may be relevant to this. And Jonathan says, do you want a phone conversation or do you need to see him? Uh, I don't know. I was just planning on having a phone conversation anyways. Yeah. But if, if it doesn't, yeah, I've got, you know, it's important to ask the question. So I'm assuming if you were aware of any information, you could have shared it by now. Uh, but yeah, I have not. Um, then, you know, I'm officially asking right now, do you know of any? Uh, and then John says, I have not had any. He doesn't have any information on this. Any additional information. Any additional information. Uh, that, and certainly my parents would not because he did not speak with them very frequently. And then my sister, I think all of us, for us, it's just a big mystery. That's what um, Jonathan Drake says. This is just all a big mystery. We don't have any information. We don't know anything. Um, and then so they give up phone numbers. Um, so then... You want me to the other this? one I would give. The other one I would give a call to would be my brother-in-law. He's another one that they have a lot of lengthy conversations. And I'm wondering if she's talking about Emily's. Husband. Yeah, that's it. Uh, and then she asks what Jennifer's maiden name was no. and where you're originally from. And um she, Montana. Where in Montana? Cali Spell. And that's where he lives now. And what's his name? I just say Matt. Matt. Yeah. And he's your brother-in-law? Yes. Okay. He's... My sister's husband. Your sister's husband. What's your sister's name? Emily. Okay. And they live in Klepsi? Yeah. Klepsbell? <laughs> <laughs> and your husband communicates with him sometimes? Is that... Yes. Why you're... They would come over. They would spend a lot of evenings doing a lot of talking. And we would go on trips together. So this is a receipt for the 600 and the miscellaneous documents. I'm just going to keep handing you documents. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to make a copy of this. Okay. This is Tolson. We'll hang on to the original and I'll give you a copy of this. Thank you. It will take about five hours. Then this analyst comes back in the room and says, her phone is going to take five more hours. <clears throat> oh, good Lord. Really? Yeah. To put it in perspective, Normally an iPhone is around 12. This is 43. 
So mine really a lot. It has a lot in it. Yours, um, I would imagine you do a lot of like emojis. My sister sent a lot of emojis or gifts things of that nature gifts that's what they do as soon as he said that and that's this and that's her mom i thought oh my goodness a lot of gifts oh yes a lots and lots okay ryan now this is the ryan is saying the current sorry is your phone what what are you sorry about family then says what are you sorry about Ryan is saying the current schedule right now is at least five more hours on your phone. And you really need all of that? We really don't need all of that. This is family then. But we don't know what we don't know. So we'd like to have all the text messages preserved and all the phone calls preserved. So if anything comes up, we can go back and look in and say what happened on this date and what happened at this time. That's why we're, we've, and then the analyst says, I've got all the text messages, but the MMS is what's taking the most time. And that's where they have a lot of metadata behind them. So it's just going to take some time. Dan Levin says, trust me, it's, how do I put this? I don't want to say I'm on your side because that's not really how this works. I'm actively trying to seek the truth. Right. And seeking the truth means we have to turn over every stone. Yes. In cases like this, always we look at the spouse as having a motive potentially. So your cooperation with us is very helpful because it means that you're not off on a bad footing of you, that we're not off on a bad footing with you. Me wondering why you're not cooperating and me having to get search warrants for your phone and your house and stuff like that. Yeah. So this is way, it's, it's way much better. Cooperation is much better, well received and everything just works better. So I really can't think of anything else at this point. I'm certain that we're going to, um, you know, have more questions going forward, but, but still have a lot to do. So, and then, Jonathan. and then Jonathan has, well, I have a question or two for you, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Jonathan says, so are you expecting to want to come to the house and look through the house? Um, and then Van Lee said, not unless something else comes up. Let's put it, let's put it that. So they haven't gone through the house. <laughs> this is, March 16th, they haven't gone through um, the, he was killed on March 12th, March 16th. They haven't gone through the house of Jennifer Drake yet. So Jonathan asks, so are you expecting a one to come to the house and look through the house? Well, not unless something else comes up. Let's put it like that. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Uh, so we've kind of noticed that the Bonners Ferry PD has done a number of press releases. Uh, we don't have then detective, you know, family, but we don't have any control over that. We have nothing to do with that. Because they're ISP. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, but going forward, do you do press releases? And if you do consult, uh, yes. To be agreed, yes. Like they want to be consulted on what's going out in the press releases. <laughs> okay. Um, we try we, very hard not to mess with any of that. Okay. I don't like press releases, says Van Leeuwen. I don't. It's not my thing. Press releases are something more that the county sheriffs do or the city chiefs do because it's a political thing. And they want to be perceived as doing something. We like to just kind of stay in the background and be ignored. So think about the Idaho 4 case. Okay. Again, I'm going to say this. ISP says, I don't like press releases. I don't. It's not my thing. Press releases are are something more that the county sheriffs do or the city chiefs do, AKA Fry, because it's a political thing and they want to be perceived as doing something. We like to just kind of stay in the background and be ignored. Most people, honestly, most people in the state of Idaho don't even understand that the state police even have detectives or an investigative or investigation division. And we like it that way. Jonathan says, yeah, okay. As far as information flow, I'm just asking questions that I just, for, for her benefit. Oh yeah. Um, information flow. I realize that you know the investigation is confidential, but I know, I told Jennifer early on that I will try to share as much as I can with her. Right. That's what, you know, Jonathan says. And, and I said, <clears throat> part of this, part of this is, is important that you maintain the confidentiality. So if I'm giving you information related to our investigation, mm -hmm. I need to know that it's not going to get spread. Yes. Like what we talked about, this guy being the last client and all that, you know? Oh, right. We need to follow up on that lead rather than you going and calling and talking to Eldora or whatever her name is and saying, tell me about the, yeah. 
we got to do this ourselves. I will be. And the other thing that I said, and I extended this to both of you, you have my cell phone number. You're welcome to call at any time and ask me anything you want to. Thank you. You know, I'm trying to approach in, in as a collaboration. Um, and you don't, for any reason, think that there's any reason we should think that my children and I are not safe? We don't have a motive at this point. I have no idea. I have no clue what and why this happened to your husband or who did it. I don't know. So I, my instinct is to say no. This was about your husband and this happened up in Bonner's Ferry. Right. Does that mean that there's not another motive against your family? I can't answer that question. I don't know the answer. We don't even know that answer. Odds are no. Odds are that it has nothing to do with you and your family, but we don't know what we don't know. So I'm going to say this because now that's just told and I'm going to say this because I tell this to everybody that's in, it's not in my generation, but I wouldn't, I'd stay off of Facebook, social media, texting and stuff. I know it's part of a parcel of people's lives in some instances for several reasons. One is I know it's nice to have people reach out to you and those kind of things. However, you don't know who else is reading this stuff. You don't know who else is exchanging information. One, are you saying don't post or are you saying don't read? We're, we're not saying, we're not saying anything. We're just saying, well, no, I mean a recommendation. Just consider staying off of it. Consider that you don't know who the whole audience is, unless you've got that banded down to your close friends and family. Oh yeah. No, I agree. And the second thing is unfortunately people say ugly things. Yeah. And that's really not where to argue out your lives and all that stuff. Yeah. I don't think so. On the internet, you know, I don't use it at all. I very rarely <laughs> just for your benefit. Some people may say something very, very, and it, if, if people who get on these things, I don't know why it's so ugly, but I have done some cases here and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, why do people, these things, so, so it's just up to you, you're a grown adult. Well, I have posted nothing. I rarely ever do, but I posted nothing. But I woke up yesterday and noticed that three people, independent people, have taken things that have been put out and has posted on my Facebook page starting lots of comments. Do I take that down? Do I? You have control over that though, yeah? I don't know. Do I when somebody else posts on me? Jonathan says, I'm not a Facebook guy, so. I'm not either. And then Tolson. So part of that is going to be, Ryan. This is a tech guy. You, you, have, you have control over that. You can block them and you can prevent them from putting things on your page. But if they post on mine, Am I allowed to take it down? Well, yes. Can I take it down on mine? Yep. Oh, okay. Um, then Van Leeuwen, how does she do that? You'll be, I mean, it's going to be an option in one of your corners. And then if it keeps happening, if you block them as a person, then they can't post in your timeline ever. Well, I think they mean well. Like even one of them is from our church. Another one is from our acting community. I think they mean well because they say kind things on it. It's just that I'm not the one that wants to put that stuff out there. So it's not like, maybe I could just go to them and say, I just didn't know if I had the option to go in and change what somebody else has actually put on. On the post, it will have a little option and you'll be able to remove it from your feed. Okay. Okay. Uh, and some people, um, uh, we see become involved with the investigation. They want to, and we'll spend hours. I notice that our police department chasing something that really isn't. And people think that's funny. And I don't know why yeah. Tolson says that people are like internet sleuths and he doesn't understand. <laughs> that was hilarious to me. Let me clear my, <clears throat> again, welcome to the transparency. Um, Again, ISP Tolson, ISP Van Leuven, interviewing Jennifer Drake. This is as up close as you could possibly get to how these investigators operate and work. Um, uh, also, just for the record, we're not reading like this on purpose. It's written very, Jennifer Drake talks very choppy. She doesn't finish sentences. So 
anytime that happens, it's it's how she's speaking in the transcripts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so continuing on here. <clears throat> Let me clear my throat. <laughs> All right, so let's see. It's happened to us. Well. It's happened to us several times. I had a child murder case many years ago, same thing. We had to chase down everybody that posted and ask them why they posted this. And then they go, well, just because I can. They could care less. There is no crime against it. So just. Oh, wow. I'm telling you, I'm not telling you what to do. Yeah. I'm just suggesting that sometimes these things happen. Be careful. Then Van Lee, but that's what Tolson was saying. So Tolson was just all about social media and Facebook. That, that was like his biggest chime in right there. Uh, then Van Leeuwen, if you see something that you're concerned about or think that we should have talked to you about or or you want to know more about, just call me. Okay. I'll answer my phone and I'll answer your questions as best as I can. No. I feel like I'm very, very grateful for the time and your willingness. That's what the people of the state of Idaho pay us for. I think, I can't think of anything else off the top of my head right now. I know we've been here for a while. Okay. And we're going to do this again, says Tolson. We'll have some follow-ups. So so don't be surprised. Okay. But you've given us some more people to talk to and some more things to do. So we'll, you know, I'm glad to know that you talked to us about Mike's gym. We didn't know about that at all. So that's definitely something we need to follow up on. It's what's been happening. That is. At, at Mike's gym. A bit of an aggravation because I had full conversation with Ken about that. And he said everything. I kept give him things and he would say, I'll pass it. I'll pass it on. It was, yeah, Ken is. Okay. Now, so yeah, not saying Ken isn't, we haven't talked to him yet about it. So Ken is one of obviously law enforcement. And so she's been talking to other people and saying stuff and giving them things. And they're like, okay, I'll pass it on. I'll pass it on. And here she's saying, basically when they say we had no idea about this Mike's gym, and here she's like, well, that's really frustrating because I've told them about this. What's going on? And then Tolson saying, well, we're not saying Ken isn't. We just we haven't talked to him yet about it. So you see how these guys aren't talking like they're not talking to the um, local law enforcement. You know, because we have to sit down as detectives, he says. I think it's Ken. I think it's he's passed things on to Marty or he's passing things on to Marty is the chief assistant chief Marty Ryan. Because there's so many heads and they're not talking to you. I don't think it's Ken. I think we have we have a detective meeting. I see. And we'll start to exchange information. We're still running that first 48. It is March 16th, 2020. The murder was March 12th, 2020. This is way outside of the first 48. And we'll start to exchange information. I mean, we're still running that first 48. We're still... We have teams of detectives up there right now collecting video and interviewing people. Okay. And when we get done here with you, I'm going to direct them to go over and interview the Mike's Gym people and the two other guys you talked about. So, and they're working on following up on all the tips that have come into the sheriff's office in the last 24 hours. So we have, we may have a resolution to this in 24 hours. We just can't ever predict that. Okay. So this doesn't start to slow down, really, until we get done with all of this. All of this stuff to do is all going to be actively done in order of priority. So when we're done with all of that, and if we have no developed leads or suspects, then we'll have to stop and reevaluate and figure out what's the next thing to do. So, I mean, I can already see, you know, we've got a month or two worth of work. So just sitting here. I mean, all of the clients we've got to talk to, if we if we find, if we run into a lead or a suspect, this can all end quickly. But if we don't, then we just keep going and going and going and going with the Energizer Bunny. Yeah, okay. Thank you. You guys seem like terrors. Terriers. Terriers who keep digging, says jo Jonathan Drake. It's the job. Yeah, that's what we do. So anyways, with that, I'm going to end the recording at 1659, which is... 459. Okay. 
That was the first interview that was recorded of Jennifer Drake. Four days after her husband is murdered. And they're telling and acting like, you know, we're still working on the first 40, like we're still in the first 48. They have not been in, into her home. <laughs> and they're giving her a lot of information. And if you start in any murder investigation, it was, you know, you start with the spouse and they're even telling her that. Why are they giving her this? Um, you know, so it's like in the beginning, Hey, we're going to give you information that they try to say, you got to keep it confidential. We want to keep things confidential. Um, so right here, it's important though, to Mark 459 ended this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but on March 16th, 2020, they sent, um, rich, one of their guys on over to talk to El Dora and her brother and husband. and husband and niece. They were all in on this interview. And that happened on March 16th. Tell them who Eldora, her husband, and everybody is. For those that missed it. Well, I'm going to let them hear all about what Eldora had, had no, to say. Tell them. So those are the last patients purportedly that saw Dr. or Brian Drake the day he was murdered. Yep, Eldora. Yep, yep, yep. Um, Virginia Slim said, at Willie, you know Lena. She always has good stuff. <laughs> Law enforcement lost my respect when they staged Brent's murder and wiped his phone clean. They're dirty as they come, says Willie. Yep. <clears throat> so, yeah. Yeah. So, um, now, what ends up happening here? March 16th, again, two really big interviews, in my opinion, happen. And that would be uh, Eldora and uh, Emma, Eldora, and then her family, obviously, they're all there together. Uh, Emma, the, what do you want to call her? The massage therapist. And, um, and they have another conversation here with Jennifer on March 17th, 2020. Is that on the phone? <clears throat> it's over the phone. And, um, but it's important here. We're going to switch gears so you can hear what is said by um, Eldora on March 16th. I have a recording for you guys, and then this will close it out. Um, well, remind them about my live. Oh yeah, don't forget about Bella's live. She's gonna read that um, air mail blooms part five. She's a good reader. Good morning, Boston. Hi, honey. Hi. Busted flush. Well, you're right here at the right time, guys, because this is about to drop a bomb. Okay. I'm going to save my voice for the reading. <clears throat> honey and tea, honey and tea. Hope everyone's doing good today. Almost done with the week, halfway through. Brooke E. all day, every day. <laughs> want to make everybody know that George Washington did not win the Mega Millions last night. That is why this is paused. George Washington was going to split that with everybody that was a member of this channel. <laughs> really? <laughs> George Washington and I share the same birthday. 
George Washington. The real one. The transcription. So this is Eldora, and we're at uh, this other residence, 49740 Highway 95. Mm -hmm. Give us a brief explanation of your knowledge of the incident on March 12th. Uh, I, I guess I'll just start with setting up the appointment. Yes, um, I sent a text message the day prior, so Wednesday. Um, that's always how we set up appointments. So if you have any openings, um, he was pretty booked, so I didn't. We didn't expect to get him, so I just told him well, Monday would be fine, but we could if you know we could come in. That works. So. Um, Went to the airport to pick up my niece, um, took our time on the way back, and then later in the day, we met up in the year or so, um, I got a text message back saying, I was about six o'clock, end of the day, it's gonna squeeze us in any move. So I said, oh, okay, sure, we'll take it. So we came back, I spoke, um, Sonia wasn't feeling well, so she stayed home. And Keiko and I went to the appointment. We got there at 6.03, and we noticed that because I, I made a comment in the car, 6.03, we're almost there. <laughs> so um, we pull up, and there's pretty much no cars there, um, except for a, a, a large uh, light color. I, I want to say it was a white pickup truck. Um, but a heavy duty Ford pickup truck, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a Ford pickup truck. Um, parked uh, to, to the right. Um, the doctor's car was parked right next to the building. I parked right next to him. Empty spot, pickup truck. So we go in um, to our appointment. He had another uh, patient. In there, so we sat in the waiting room. Um, he played <laughs> a little bit of music while we waited, and I guess we waited about ten minutes or so. Um, and then, so the patient came out. Um, it barely got it. Never noticed him before. Um, I've had appointments at that time, you know, in the past. Just want to let everybody know that what she said there in case she had a hard time hearing is that when they had pulled in, it was a docks car. It was a fairly empty parking lot. She parked next to the dock. There was an open spot next to her. And then there was that, that truck, that white truck that she says that she believes was a Ford. Okay. So that truck was there when she arrived. And she's right now she's describing the big burly guy. Yeah. That's walking out. She had never she had never seen him before. She so here you go. I know the clients because they're so this guy is different. So um I said hi to him. Um he didn't really respond, so he just walked out and so I had gotten my camera out because he was gonna play it song um for Brian when he came out because we we were um I had plans to come back because I had gone to an uh, another clinic and we're going to discuss some things about my care. So anyway, so he was playing some music and had the video tape going, or the video camera going. And so he played a song. We went in, had our appointment. Um, I was first. Um, um, I, I did notice that the window shade was wide open, which to me was unusual. Um, he usually always can close as the window shade especially when it's dark, so I, I thought that was kind of odd. Um, she says that the window shade is wide open. This is so important, you guys. Okay, the window and, shade is wide open. Which is unusual, she says. Yeah. What I didn't say anything, you know, so I figured just the three of us and then So I have my appointment, um, and just before he... Um, had his appointment, the phone rang, and um, it was his wife. So he was sitting at his desk, which is uh, his desk, the window's right behind him. So 
um, he talked a little bit with his wife and then, and then got started on, on kick on. So, I mean, and then, and then that was it. So we left, um, uh, after 7.15, um, got in the car, didn't notice any vehicles at that point because it was just dark out. Um, I backed up my car because I was parked forward like this. So I backed up my car and we could take a straight shot and just drive between the doctor's office and the coffee shop. Um, and I halfway thought of it, except there was a big pickup truck stopped right there. And so as she's leaving at 7.15, she says that um, it's dark outside. She pulls the her vehicle back, and what she thought about doing was just going through the drive through in between the two buildings, the coffee shop and that, but that she couldn't get through because there was a big white truck that was right there. Like now that white truck that was parked, you know, a parking spot over, now it was um, parked, preventing her from possibly being able to go through um, and out that way. She knew the truck was on because the running lights were on. But um, the brake lights weren't on, so it's not like somebody was stopped with their foot on the brake. Anyway, I noticed the truck right there, and I thought, well, you know, if I try to go that way, I can't get around them to go around the building. So I just turned left and went between the far north outfitters building and the t-shirt shop because I thought the way through the parking lot and just went out that way. And then, so we, um, let's turn the number. Yeah, we stopped at the grocery store. And she needed something at the store, so we were texting. So we know that we were at the grocery store at 728. So. 728 at the grocery store, okay. 728 at the grocery store. Isaac's 911 call, allegedly, because we have no idea if this is fact, due to the total mishaps with the, you know, probable cause of arresting Dr. Moore. But that Isaac's 911 call came in at 7:29, and that since they all walked out together, you know, um, Isaac saying and giving a description of, you know, Kakoa, Caleb Kakoa, um, but he never said that he saw like Eldora. Eldora. Um, and they just get into a vehicle right there. This guy didn't, like, they didn't go running off or anything, right? Because we have text messages for um, that kind of thing. So um, um, it wasn't until the next day in the evening, I got a call about 7.30 or so. Um, maybe a little later, I could look at my um, notes. Um, <clears throat> A friend of mine, um, Mary Fogelby, called me, and she said, um, have you heard about this incident in town? And I said, oh, no. She said, someone got shot. And I said, no, because I had been gone all day to the airport. And um, she said, no, I don't you know, want to alarm me or anything, but the word's been getting around that it, it might be Dr. Drake. And I, I was just, I was shocked. <laughs> and I said, when was this? And she said, well, oh, I think it was about 7.30 that Thursday night. <laughs> of course, that hit me hard because we were just there. We had just left. Um, so the reason she called me is because she thought I might be able to find out if that was true, if it was him. 
Right there. I thought it was the same truck that is omitted from the PCA. It's omitted from completely from the PCA because that what does what that puts a truck there from, you know, five something o'clock when that previous appointment would have been before Eldora's at six. So that truck, she's like, I thought it was the same truck. Okay. And which would mean that this truck who they're trying to say is Dr. Moore's. Um, so this truck was there. Uh, beforehand, before she even got there. And then when she gets out, the truck has been moved and is running and it's running. And it's in front of now uh, in between the two buildings, right up against the, the wall of Dr. Drake's. We can show you that building. Yeah. We, I think we've already showed that, but we can. Um, With the appointment, it was dark out. So I'm, I'm assuming that you know, I guess my backing up and my headlights shining, I just figured it was the same truck because it was the same heavy duty looking truck. I can't say that it was the same truck, but it 
it was like a three kids being worked up white color. You know, that that's what it looked like to me. I just looked at it and thought, oh, that's cool. The guys will sit here. I guess I'll go this shit. So, when you spoke to her, did you see a passenger in and get anybody out? Uh, I couldn't, it was too dark. Okay. I couldn't see, but I knew the truck was on. Right. So, I figured someone was just sitting there. And I probably don't have a picture of the uh, overhead okay. of the. Uh, I can describe it to you, though. Was it on the roadway, an alleyway? Or like okay. So, if, if this is. So blue tape I'm just drawing is square to represent um, the building and another square to represent far north and a Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use um, Hector the projector to do exactly what he's doing right now. Okay. I'm gonna use Hector? Hector, get on! Get on with your bad self, Hector. Get off for your lunch break. Hector, lunch break is over. Okay, so I'm going to use Hector. Okay, so let's share. Share screen, Hector, you're off break. Let's do it. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's a big guy. Um, I would say he's at least six feet tall. 
uh, yeah, so I'm, yeah, tall, probably tall. Um, he was wearing kind of bluish gray t shirt, baggy t shirt, very large because he was a huge guy, but he was a big guy. Um, as I said, I've never seen him before, but you know, people come out of the office when I'm waiting. I, I say hi, I, I, I say hi to people. <laughs> and then he just, he just kind of glanced at him because he was sitting off against the wall, close to the office. And I was sitting against the firewall towards the parking because I was on a video taking the same song for, for Brian. And uh, so he walks out, glances, and then I say hi, and he just looks at me and then turns, opens the door. And just before he shuts the door, I start the video so you can hear the door go clink. <laughs> um, but he's just a great big guy, a, a Caucasian guy, um, t shirt, but. but it looked like kind of a hard hard t shirt, um, jeans, 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 jeans. I would say, um, my granddaughter has a, another hat that's about the same size, so I would say about 6566. Six, six. Okay, um, pretty close to 425, 450 pounds, maybe. That's the same. I, didn't, I didn't think he was that big, but. <laughs> Okay, so in Jennifer Drake's interview on 316, uh, Tolson and uh, Van Leeuwen were asking Jennifer Drake, who this Paul Jacobson, have you ever heard this name? No, I've never heard it. Um, and they're like, okay, we'll do, they're trying to like, okay, is it, uh, there's a couple different Paul Jacobsons and they're trying to send up a picture. Okay, they're trying to find this guy's file through Brian Drake's stuff. They can't find Paul Jacobson's file anywhere. Okay. And they asked Jennifer, do you know who this person is? Um, no. And that's all she says. It's just no, nothing with it. So what they're showing her right now is whatever picture. And it was a driver's license picture of whatever Paul Jacobson they went with. And this is Eldora. They're showing this to. Correct. Good. I 
Remember, Jennifer Drake calls now at 642, okay? Because remember, um, Eldora was not a planned patient. For whatever reason, Dr. Drake did an amazing thing for himself. And he decided, okay, to have Eldora come in at six, which was not planned. With her brother. Okay, because it was that she was coming in with her brother, all right? And because her brother was in from Hawaii, and so they were both gonna get adjusted. Um, and so he texts her back on that day, on Thursday at 3 p.m. to say, hey, you know what, can you come in at six? I can squeeze you guys in. And so he comes in and, uh, or she says yes. So then, but originally the last patient that Dr. Drake would have seen, would have seen. That day. That day would have been Paul Jacobson. Okay, but Dr. Drake at 3 p.m. texted Eldora. And so then she comes in. And this would be a huge hiccup if somebody knew Dr. Drake's schedule. Okay, so then the guy that was there, this Paul Jacobson, you would have your appointment, you would get in your vehicle, and then you would leave. So when Eldora came out, there should have been just her car and the doc's car. Okay. Uh, but when she comes out, the same truck that was there when she arrived, which would be logic saying that would be Paul Jacobson's truck, was still there when she left. And now it was moved. It was not parked where it was before. And it was running. And it was parked up against in between the two um, buildings. I'm going to share the screen again. Um, right here. So that's the truck right there. Yeah. And at first it was parked here. So like this is the back door that they would have walked in through the glass door. Okay. Because it's a four sweeter. Um, and in the back is where like the docks car, then Aldora, and there was a space, and then there was the truck. Well, when she's walking out with Kakoa, Caleb. When she's done with her appointment, right? Yeah, when she's done with her appointment. Um, and she said it had to be, it was after 7.15, okay? Dr. Drake makes a phone call at 7.17 p.m. Oh, to was. his wife, and they're on the phone for nine minutes, okay? And she says in 15 seconds, okay? Now, so she's, Eldora says that, they had to be there till, you know, it was after like, it had to be like after 7.15 because then they get to the grocery store by 7.28 p.m. OK, 
Okay. But they, Eldora and her uh, brother walk out the glass doors to her vehicle. And this truck, it's a very tight squeeze. And so she thought that she could not, you know, squeeze by to leave. So she then sees that the truck is on. And what she does is she comes out this way. Okay. And leaves out El Paso and then coming back or up and around. Um, <clears throat> so this truck, which logic would tell you is belonging to the person that was in the appointment first, because she believes that it's the same truck, that it was still there. And remember what was planned is, is that Eldora. So when Eldora comes in at six Oh three. Okay. Paul Jacobson gets this, you know, you know, hearing people come to the door and okay, the next patients are here. Um, oh, fuck. You know, he was disgruntled. He seemed agitated. All right. So then he, he leaves, but he doesn't like he leaves the physical building, but he doesn't leave the physical um, area lot, a lot. And this is what the eyewitness is saying to the police. Then this is what's interesting now. Now, I, Isaac, which we're getting confirmation on, he has a girlfriend that's a living girlfriend with him living across the street. Isaac and his girlfriend say that they heard two gunshots. Not one, but two. And the description, though, that Isaac gives, allegedly, okay, is that they give that description of Kakoa. Okay. Um, they didn't walk out the front blue door or anything like that to then walk by the truck. That's not how they walked away. All right. They walked out through the back. So here's Isaac. Here's where they would have walked. Okay. Now I would like to think that um, how would you possibly be able to see anything if a big truck is blocking the view of somebody walking to their, I mean, it's a very short distance. So it's all just very interesting and we're going to get in, into all of that, but here, this is all left out of the PCA because why <laughs> this isn't going to arrest Dr. Moore. Okay. We got a guy that just was disgruntled, totally does not ma match the description of Dr. Moore and that they waited and that their truck was still there when Eldora left. Now, 715, he gets, he calls his wife and allegedly have a nine minute and 15 minute conversation. So that's why they're putting the time that the shooting happened was at 726 PM. All because based on all based on Jennifer. not the phone call that Jennifer made to 911, because there is no phone call that was made to 911. So in a PCA, it should read, this is what time the 911 call was at. No, they don't have Jennifer's 911 call. They say that based on Jennifer saying she was on the phone, how long were you on the phone with him when you heard the whole, that it went dead and all that crap? She says about 15 seconds. So that's why they're at, you know, the seven, 17 plus the nine minutes gets you at, we believe that the shooting was approximately around 726. Well, why would you just use when she got off the phone then and when she called 911, why don't you use that as the time? Because that never happened. And then you have at 729 though. All right. At 729, now check this out. At 729, that's when Isaac says that that's the, the number that they're using, the time that they're using, because that's when Isaac called 911. But if Isaac was to actually see, because what he says is, is he sees them after he hears the shots, he sees them walk out. And then or I shouldn't say them. He sees Kakoa walk out of there. And walk out of where? And walk out of where? This is what's in the PCA. And walk out of where? And then he then got in his car and went to try to go find him to take a picture of him. Isaac got in his car. Isaac got in his car. And he said that he went, but this is what's strange, is that he walked up in front of this building and then past there's like a little fence here that you can hardly see and then walked towards the um along the sidewalk and walked towards 
uh, the State Farm Building, which is over here, and then Dr. Moore's office is like over this way. <clears throat> but that he couldn't find him. And then that's when he called 911, allegedly. And I said, who's going to call 911? Did you see a body? You call 911 if you see a body. You don't call 911 because you hear gunshots. Unless that's all you're going to say is, oh, I heard gunshots. I'm just calling 911 because I heard, it's, it's, I saw, it sounds like I heard gunshots, 911, so I'm going to call. I think I heard gunshots. I don't know. I saw some guy running from a building, but I, I don't know. I went to try to go find him, and I couldn't find him. I'm chasing him with my vehicle. Yeah. Versus a call like this. I found, oh, my God. I, I heard gunshots. I look out. There's this guy by the window. He had just taken a shot through the window. I'm going over. Like I, I had to go by the window. There's a guy laying in that's on the ground. You know, none of that. They didn't play a 911 call in court. And in fact, they said, oh, we have the wrong 911 call they here. They started to play, <laughs> right? So they started to play a 911 call. And what did they do, Lana? Yeah. They stopped They stopped it. it. They stopped the 911 <clears throat> call. And and it's like, we, but here, this probable cause affidavit was not written up until, you know, August. All right. But you know, all of this that's happening in March, sitting right in front of your face. And, um, and so, but now Jennifer tells the police, she didn't hear the gunshots. And she says gunshot. She didn't hear it. But the story she's giving her other friends. Correct. Is that she was, well, we'll let, we'll let it play out. We'll let it play. So this is just wild. We want you to see exactly what's going on. These are the same officers and detectives that are involved in the Brian Kohlberger case. So if you don't think this is important, by all means, you don't think it's important. Do I think that Ann Taylor feels that way? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I've already emailed Ann Taylor to say, what would you like on a silver platter? And someone said, well, Lana should just go work for these attorneys. Yeah, I just said, how many hours for free for them? You know what I'm saying? Like, here you go. But you're only as good as the evidence that you have in the courtroom. And I witness multiple eyewitnesses now i'm curious you guys think paul jacobson was ever questioned and the kicker is, is that paul jacobson lives in corlean hayden why does a man drive an hour and 15 minutes to go see a chiropractor and then the second kicker is the big kicker oh i guess you could probably say it's the biggest kicker of them all is that paul jacobson's daughter is a chiropractor she's a doctor she has her own practice excuse me Lana. yeah you just heard that Paul Jacobson's daughter is a chiropractor? Yeah, North Idaho Physical Therapy. So you're telling me Paul Jacobson has a daughter who's a chiropractor and he lives in a totally different city, but he drove to Bonner's Ferry to, to go see Dr. Dre or Brian yeah, Dre? Yeah, and that there's no file on this guy. And that there's... So there's no file on this guy. He drives an hour and 15 minutes. His daughter is a chiropractor. He leaves, he, he leaves an appointment, but it, but doesn't leave the area because his truck's still there, which I, well, I'm saying allegedly but only because it's logic to say that he drove there in that truck. <clears throat> doesn't say hi to Eldora. Mm -mm. And it was like, fuck shit. Our plans fucked. And then that's why I believe the Jennifer Green make a call or Jennifer uh, Drake make a call to say at 642 because He's sitting in his truck like, what the hell's going on here? Like, how much longer is this going to be? Like, hey, they're still in there. What? Who is who's being contacted and who's being called here? But, um, you know, there was just a, you know, 13 second phone call that happened between Jennifer and um, her husband at 642. And that's when he said, I'm still with patients. Um, Can I call you back later? Mm -hmm. And then he calls at 717. And, um, and, and this is when you need to hear this part, press play. And then this is when he started playing the music. So, um, but yeah, that, that was different too. Right. They have obvious signs of 
no hostility or no, just that the guy just had no reactions. It's a friendly hello. Right. And do you have the video? I do. Okay. Yeah. If, uh, if I can get that sent to my work phone. So man, it's is it which is is it Kate Dawn? Is it the old man or no, I don't my full name is Kate Kate Dawn? And my oldest son's middle name is Caleb. This is them playing the tape of the video. the video of the ukulele being played in the waiting room. You'll hear about this video a lot. I 
reaction. I was just shocked. You can hear my reaction when I saw him come out with that leg brace. I was what happened because I was gone for a moment. Okay, please listen to this. She sees him come out of the doctor's office with a leg brace to greet her. Okay. And she's in shock because she's like, what is, what is this? What happened to you? I was like, oh, 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 what? See, the last time, um, well, he had that spinal stenosis, so he had surgery. And then, uh, Okay, so he had spinal, some type of surgery. Okay, so he was laid up for eight weeks. Um, Paul Jacobson's daughter is a chiropractor, but she works for a physical therapy place that... She's the chiropractor of this physical therapy place, physical therapy of Northern Idaho. And she's the head doctor. Okay. That is located in um, Hayden Coeur d'Alene right there. And what do you do if you have like a huge back surgery? You have physical therapy. Okay. And it's just ironic that in 2019, she's making videos on social media. This daughter of Paul Jacobson is talking about if you have like a horrible slip and fall, you know, different things. She's talking about opiates, like um, come and see a chiropractor. It can help you get off of opiates if you have chronic pain and you're taking medicine, stuff like that. But then she's also talking about slipping and falling. But this is a person that somebody would go and see for physical therapy, like all chiropractors, like they need a chiropractor. Okay, like who's adjusting you? And this would have been somebody that I believe possibly you would, you would come across their, you know, this is a well-known physical therapy place and you're going to need physical therapy after your surgery. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. And this is all my investigation that I'm putting all the pieces together on how people could possibly cross paths. Okay. Um, oh, when I had my last appointment prior a month ago, one month ago, um, I had told them that I was going to this clinic in Mexico and um, that I would be gone for a while and then, you know, bring notes back and then take them and figure things out, that kind of thing. So I was like, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. So, yeah, that's right. So she had just gotten back from Mexico, okay? She had went and went to Mexico and she was there for like 60 to 90 days. And so this is her just getting back. So she hadn't seen him and she had seen other doctors that she says in Mexico. Okay. So I was asking him what happened? When did this happen? He said, it happened the day after I saw you last, the, the very next day. Okay. He describes how we fell down and I thought, and that was really did you guys just hear that? He's like, well, the last day I saw you uh, that happened after I saw you. So you're telling me that Brian, after he sees her, Eldora, Eldora has, it breaks his leg when he has that horrible slip and fall the day after I see you. Then, she, then the day that he sees her, he's murdered. Wait, what? It's kind of, it's kind of weird. Yeah, 
Okay, so pay attention. Listen up. This is really, really, this is important. Here it comes. Okay, so she starts tearing up here. She starts getting upset. Okay. Sale 
So, you know, I kind of got to know the kids then, you know. Um, I had them over one day when they, they came and visited me for a little bit. Um, you know, getting to know each other then. Um, sat kind of clear. His old dog is an old last for, I don't know, five days or so while we were on vacation. Um, um, but yeah, I was, I was always invited to go down and have dinner, but I, I never did go, you know. I just, just never did go. Um, but yeah, the kids were very precious. And, uh, so right here, she is explaining on March 16th that she thought it was, like, that she's consoling me. Like, Eldor is saying, I wouldn't be able to be talking about any of that. She's consoling me. Okay, she thought that that was just a little off. And um, and by she, you mean Dr. Drake's widow, Jennifer Drake, is consoling Eldora. Correct. And that, and so then she's talking about how Eldora is talking about how Jennifer and obviously, you know, Dr. Drake, that she was invited to go to their house numerous times and that she never went. Um, but that, that she did go and catch their plays, like the kids' plays. She went uh, a couple times, uh, Coeur d'Alene, and then in Spokane. But, um, but that, yeah, she was invited to come down to their house for like dinners and stuff like that, but that she had never been. And she says, well, I had them at my house once. And then, you know, you hear her say that, you know, you hear her say that. Um, and the reason that this is important, okay, the reason this is important is because when we go to transcribe for you guys, the next encounter that Jennifer Drake has with Tolson and with Van Leuven, it's like she was handed fucking Eldora's um complete this is everything that the woman has said here you go uh know about it so that you so that we talk this next time you're going to be able to it, it's insanity it's insanity what you guys are going to hear okay um uh, because it's the complete opposite so keep that in just mind. keep that just keep this in mind um no jennifer michael miller jennifer is the widow of dr drake You know, so here Aldora is kind of catching on. Like she's saying like that it was weird. Like it was like lack of empathy. Yeah, I guess you could say that. Like she's just like it's not. And when I say catching on, it's like here this woman is saying that something's off with Jennifer. Okay. And usually cops, like, what are you going to take with this? Like that should be like, yeah, this is, I mean, you'd listen to this and you'd be like, you know, holy shit. Um, and so this is on March 16th. The Tolson family when we're talking to her March 16th, and then they have a phone conversation with Jennifer on March 17th. Then they start talking to family between the 17th and the 26th. And then they have a huge talk with Jennifer on March 26th and that interview about blue my tits. Okay. Yeah, I said it. Truth and transparency with a side of tits. I could not believe what I heard. Could not believe it. Um, we're talking about people knowing about child pornography and not doing anything about it. We're talking about police being told about CP and not being like, whoa, wait, what? Who are these people? Oh, well, we just stopped being friends with them, but we still love them. Wait, what? The shit that you guys are about to hear, but I have to do everything in order so that way you understand the story. You know, I could spend all day and be on live for like 12 hours and be like, who wants to do a binge marathon? and hear about the wild, wild west of Idaho. Um, and it'd just be like one episode after another. But like, 
you guys. Yeah, and that, by the way, that is Payne's Meat Locker right there. Right, just, you know, footsteps away, as they would say. Um, so, let's see. On the same day here, um, I... On, on March 16th, they then, um, they talked to the massage therapist. Okay. Happy endings. She talks about it. She talks about happy endings. That used to be a thing, but she wasn't the one that did it. The, uh, and then, so I had the pleasure of actually interviewing her, um, for my documentary last night. She's a very nice woman. Um, and, uh, but again, the stuff that she, I mean, it's just, wow. So I can either stop it right here or um, you guys can hear some raw. Uh, oh, wait, did you, were you here, uh, Ms. Potts, when I talked about Guant Guantanamo Bay? One of uh, Tolson and Van Leuven's guys just had gotten back from Guantanamo. Which office had happy endings? Drake's office? No, no, not Drake's. It was a massage, ther massage uh, therapist. But it wasn't hers. It was back in the day they really had these in Idaho. Um, so happy endings. Yeah, this was back. This is a thing. This is a thing. Um, <laughs> Truth here says, keep going. All right. So then here, um, let's see. They didn't believe her. Believe her. They didn't believe her. They were taking their time. It was horrible. And finally, when one of the policemen showed up, they go, hey, there has been somebody here. That's when they got everybody in here. They didn't believe her. Oh, when she called the police? Yeah. Wait, so Jennifer told you there was two shots or three shots? Or two? Two. So she's talking to him. Okay, I'm just trying to write this down. So he's talking. She's talking to him. Can you just say that again? So she's talking to him on the phone, or this was through text? On the phone. They were talking. <sighs> on the phone that she was on the phone? Oh, my God. She had to hear this? And she heard it all. Okay, so she's on the phone. He says, I've been shot. Yep. And then there was another shot, and she heard him hit the floor. This is what she told me. Then she heard another shot, and it, he, he hit the floor, and she realized that he was probably dead. But that's when she called the cops or the police, and my husband took them shot, and yeah, okay, well, we'll go check it out. It'll be a few minutes before we can get anybody there, and da 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 Oh my gosh, I cannot believe she was on the phone. Yeah, she was on the phone with him when he got shot. That is... If you're wondering, my Chipotle was amazing, by the way. Um, I pause this for a second. Did you guys all hear that? Two? Two? Wait. Two shots? Wait, let me, let me take a look at this autopsy here. They only said there was one shot, that one single bullet. But Jennifer told Emma, the, the massage therapist, that she heard the two shots. She told the police that she did not. How did I not hear her? How did I not hear this? I just, I'm speechless. I thought that 
I thought they just called her because um, they were saying that there was no 911 call made from her. So that's, I don't think, I don't know if she called 911 or who she called, or if she just dialed the regular number. Yeah. Mm. You know, the police, whatever, I got you. I mean, I would, I, was, I wouldn't even think when someone said I've been shot, I'm like, what? What are you talking about? I would never think like, God, you know what I mean? I just wouldn't, so she heard it? She heard it. Oh my gosh. Okay. And so there was more, so he was shot in mall. a documentary on Brian. You haven't talked to her about all this and, and have her recap it all for you? Well, yeah, no, no, I have, because I, I was trying to, I'm trying to get more people involved to like want to, you know, from the community that have spoken because she's only with one person. So I'm just trying to get multiple people. So I'm just trying to, um, you know, get everybody's, you know, stories, see if they need. Have you talked to the girl? Have you talked to the girl that was uh, living upstairs and heard the gunshots and went out and saw whoever it was in a, in a dark hoodie leave the scene? There was somebody that was living upstairs of like the office building where Drake practiced? No, no, upstairs above the Les Schwab tire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The Aaliyah girl. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I saw that because I was trying to figure out where she was living. Like, she was living upstairs. When she went out the door, she was looking straight at the scene. And so she saw a guy with a black hoodie on? Yeah, she saw whoever it was in a dark hoodie. I wonder if she saw like anything like, did she make a phone call? I don't know that. I know the police questioned her, so I doubt that she made a phone call. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I wonder if she would talk. I wonder if she remember. you know what I mean? If she remembers anything new or... Yeah. I was just gonna say, like, like that's that. like a day that she would never forget. Would think. Especially if you heard the gunshots. Like, they heard the gunshots too. Yeah, so made her come out of the house to look to see what's going on. Oh my gosh. And then, because she had a boyfriend, right? Is that that's the girl that had the boyfriend? I don't know if it was a boyfriend or a husband. I don't know. Okay. Two of them, yeah. Um, wow. Is, is that, did any, because I have it here that there was no cameras working. Oh, there was cameras working, all right, but they were fuzzy, and so they couldn't make him be real distinct. No, there was cameras. And that's how come they knew it was probably who they think it is. But um, if they were not uh, good quality enough they could actually blow it up and get a distinct image. Wait, so the cops say that there's camera footage? There is camera footage. How do you, if you, how do I get my, because I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get people, you know, statements plus like any type of like, there's like hardly any stuff in the papers, like no one's covering this, I don't understand. Well, but there's some things, when there's a person is a, a suspect in a, in a situation, but the majority of all the leaders of the community are his good friends. They're going to be quiet. That's how come his good friend, the judge, jumped, pushed it out of court. Because it was like, this is my best, this is a good friend of mine. What? That's how come you can't do it out of court because it was they were friends. This Emma woman tells me that this gets thrown out of court because Dr. Moore and Buchanan are like best friends. The coroner, Buchanan, and Moore are besties. Wait, what? Where is she where is she hearing this from? They were friends? Mm. How do you know this? Everybody knew that. Everybody knew that when you live in a small town, you know who the kind of the, the you know, the, the, what's the coroner and the chiropractor and the chief of police and stuff. Because he was always helping them. He was always going out on scenes and helping the coroner. So he was, he was in a lot of this stuff that was going on. So 
they all knew him really well. And nobody would have thought that he could do such a thing. And so they just kept, they kept pushing things to the side. And that's one of the reasons that he never went into the He was such a good citizen for the, and a good for the community. So, and this is, you just know this just because, like, town talk, or, like... Because I know the man. I know that I, I work a lot in Red Cross and all okay. of that, so I'm out there in it, that as well. Okay. So, you know, there's just things that are when you're in a small community. Okay. There's the people who help the community, and there's those that don't. And he was one that really helped the community a lot. Yeah, that's what I was reading. So she's saying that Dr. Moore, he's a very helpful person. He was involved in the community. It's like, okay. Um, okay. I was trying to figure out what was his motive then? Why would he kill me? Because he was losing money. He was losing clients. He was losing money? Mm -hmm. Yep, people were going to a different chiropractor and and he wasn't as busy as he needed to be. What? Really? But I didn't know the brother, but I knew the woman who, his sister, and there's no way. Yeah, so. They thought that, they thought that the Eldora woman, they thought she was a suspect? Yeah. Yeah, she had to, yeah. they thought her and her brother could have been because they were the last science of the day. Wow. But that kind of proved out that they weren't. So. Yeah, yeah. And you know, do you know any Paul Jacobson guy? Oh, so he, you do know him? Like, what? what's, because he, I guess, was another patient that was seen that day? He was, but I, I never saw him personally. So I don't know anything particular about him. Okay. Did um, anybody ever say anything about this guy? Because that's the guy, I guess, that Eldora was saying that was, like, disgruntled. Mm-hmm. So was it, so is that true? Do you know that to be true? Was it not true? Is it... He was disgruntled. He was disgruntled? Yeah, I've heard that. Well, but I don't know that personally. I only heard it from other people. Oh, okay. Is it because of, like, like, service? Like, service? I I never ask questions on why he was disgruntled. I just let people talk, but I really don't know why. I just know that several people said he was really upset with Brian that day. Oh, wow. Yeah, all that I saw was what Eldora had said that the guy really didn't say hi to her and um that she just was like well usually people say hi if you say hi to somebody and it was just you know um and she said he was just like a bigger dude and um but just that he was you know that it was just off it was an off experience so how did you hear about this case I heard I heard about this case through the Idaho Four case because of the investigators. They're the same investigators in the University of Idaho, like the murder students. So, so how did you know that? How do you know to listen to that? Oh, because I I was following that when that broke news back in November of two thousand and twenty-two. Okay. And so they were then. They were filing motions, and the same detective names were coming up that were in the Brian Drake case. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, let's, that's interesting that they would work because Bonner's Ferry is not like it's right next door to Moscow, Idaho. It's, you know, a couple hours away. But, but ISP was actually the ones that were involved in, you know, and that state police. And they had to get involved because, um, the coroner had already changed some of the evidence on scene, and that's when one of the ISP guys saw him doing that, and that's when he dismissed him 
as an investigator and ask him to leave. And so it was like, hmm. Wait, or. So you know, there's a lot, there was a lot going on. Yeah, I, like evidence, moving evidence, like touching moving evidence, touching the and I have to keep guys told me that himself. What? Okay. The ISP guy told her this himself that the coroner, when he arrived, was moving evidence. Oh boy. Oh. Well, you know what's interesting about that is, is you know that ISP did not get on the case until the next day on March thirteenth. So how would he know that the, the evidence was moved on March 12th? One of them was there before he was actually put on the case. What? What the? You got to be shitting me. I'm going to repeat that so if they She hear. says. She says. Oh, don't worry. You guys can just run it back. Are you allowed to say who, or you don't want to say who? I, I don't blame you. Okay. I don't know which one it was. Okay. But that's what they were saying. They were saying that this coroner was moving evidence. Mm -hmm. And so therefore was like, okay, hey, he can't. You're, yeah, you can't be a part of this case. Sorry. Which is 100% incorrect information because coroner Mick Millett went there on March 13th to bag and tag with ISP present um, the, the victim. So again, for those of you guys that did not hear what she said, she said that um, an ISP officer told her directly that this Mick Millett, the coroner, came to the crime scene and started messing with evidence at the crime scene on March 12, 2020. And I say, well, ISP wasn't even there yet because they didn't get on the case until almost at midnight on, you know, going into the March 13th. And Van Leuven and the other guy, Tolson, they did not make entry to the building where Brian Drake's body was still laying at 3 p.m. 20 hours after. Okay. Sitting, still laying there um, in the building on March 13th, 2020, they obtain a search warrant to go into the building where they see Brian Drake's body still, ISP. And um, they see, you know, we'll get into all of that though. And so they got a new coroner. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. And the ISP guy, one of the ISP guys is the one that told me that. I said, so why is Brian's body not here in the water? Because he said, because the coroner here was messing with the evidence. What? That's what they told you? Well, Bonner does not have a medical examiner. They have to send the body to Spokane. That's normally what they do. No, but we had a, he was a coroner. Yeah, but a coroner isn't a medical examiner. It's two different things. Right. But and they took it totally out of his hands. So they well, they would have to because he couldn't do that role. He could. He could have transported. He could have got the body ready. He could have transported it to Spokane. But they knew that from what little they were seeing him behave that they didn't dare because he would have altered whatever. So all I know is what they told me. Yeah, wow. That's interesting. We got him out of there. We got him out of there. So why was he busy trying to protect his buddy? Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. It left me with a, a lot of questions. And why has... Oh, it's just too much. I hear you. And then when it went to this Idaho Supreme Court, it was like... And I have the whole live um, Idaho Supreme Court. I am playing that today. So you guys can see the court. Um, I have all of that. So I'm going to go ahead and play it. It's audio and visual in the courtroom. 
the whole hearing. You guys are going to be able to hear what she's about to talk about. Why did they throw out the evidence? How can a man shoot somebody, admit it on tape, and then it gets thrown out of, of, of evidence? I don't know. I well, because the, because the, I don't know if you've, have you heard the, because I've heard that. You can't, this guy was asking for a lawyer six different times, and then he just finally said, what do you want me to say? So I'll say whatever you want me to say. And so he just said whatever. Well, and, and the way that he described that he exactly. killed the man is not even possible. That's not how he was killed. So it was like a false confession, which is a coercion that's like a, you know, when somebody asks for a lawyer, you have to give them a lawyer. When you don't do that, it's your rights that are being violated. What I heard, the part that I heard was like, well, do you think I should call a lawyer? And they kept saying, well, that's up to you. But I didn't hear all of it, so I don't know. Yeah, it was like, it was so long, too. It was like a really long conversation. I just know that as soon as you say the word, you know, I think I need an attorney, anything along those lines of, um, yeah, I think I'm getting an attorney or I think I should call an attorney. I need like supposed to hand over a phone and, uh, you know, just stuff like that. Then I'm just shocked that why didn't they go to Dr. Moore and have him on his radar right in the beginning in like May? I mean, March. Why did they not? They suspected him. That's when they, they suspected him for some. But they suspended him right off the gate? They did. Two of the IFP did. Oh. The what? Where is she getting this information from? Again, this is news to me. Like I, you know. But their hands were tied because they were not the official officers or investigators. And it wasn't until other stuff came up that they were able to say, hey, let's have a look at this guy. Yeah. Okay. And once again, that's just not true. They became officially on and in charge of this case, as you guys have been hearing the conversation. Okay. They became official. ISP was on this case at the end of the day. So the murder was at like 7.30 p.m. They were on this case within four hours, the lead. Okay. So what she is saying right here is factually incorrect. Factually wrong. She's saying that these ISP officers knew they were on Moore's path right away how how what did, what then why didn't they go ever talk to him no one even mentions more um wow it's just um so that that paul jacobson guy was basically talked to and cleared but <clears throat> As far as I know. Because um, I just know in the beginning, you know, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, you know, uh, Jennifer didn't even, like, she was saying certain people, and it was really big on that Scott Crawford guy. So I was just curious if, like, so basically what you're telling me, though, is that, hey, you know, we all know who did it. We just need evidence, like, because they threw it out because of the false confession. So, why wasn't there any evidence in terms of like all the cameras, like the, his car or truck or, I mean. His, his truck was close by, but he claimed that he was out driving because he had a bad stomach ache and he was uh, kicking a piece of shit as a gum. Um, what? Um, yeah. Oh, God. Are you kidding? When you have a stomach ache and diarrhea, you don't go in your truck and take, go for a drive. That's ridiculous. They said that's why he said he was out there. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, and then do you know anything about like that meat locker place that's right over there? A little bit. Okay, like is that can you store stuff there? Yeah, people can. Did anybody ever did anybody ever search that place? For what? Like a murder weapon or anything? It would have been closed. Oh, closed? Like you couldn't go in there because of coronavirus? 
No, it was closed and locked up. It, it's a nine to five job. You, you have to be there during working hours. Oh, I just mean like bring it back on a different day or, you know what I mean? I was I thought at one time somebody said that the post that, uh, that, that he, he would show them where he shoot the gun in the river. Threw the gun in the river? <laughs> I thought that was what one of them said, that he had volunteered to show where he had thrown the gun in the river. But I don't know. Yeah. If, if that's what I heard one of them telling me. Oh, wow. Because I was, the reason this caught my attention, because I couldn't believe it, that the Bonner's Ferry hadn't had a murder since like the 1960s. And I was like, holy crap. I mean, that's a long time. And that's just like a testament to like, you know, the area. It's pretty safe then. You know, no one's getting you know, killed. Um, and, um, and so I was like, you know, wow. Um, I don't know. I had seen, like I said, the different the different names. They were the same in the, the if you could get a transcript of all that stuff, why didn't they give you a copy of all the footage of the camera? Well, that's, I was told there was none. They were... Well, there was, but it was, they said it was too blurry to... to yeah, they said that they weren't working. They were just for show. Like, the gun store didn't have... Like, they had guns. Or, I'm sorry. Of course they had guns. They had cameras, but that they weren't... That they were just for show. They weren't working. And they had told us to Jennifer Drake, too. Cause she's like, what do you, what do you mean that they weren't, what do you mean they're just for show? What do you mean they, yeah, they took 18, they said that they took 18 cameras from the different businesses around, but the ones that like that coffee shop, uh -huh. yeah, n nothing was there. Uh, no, there was, there was footage, but they, I was told by one of the police that it, it was too blurry. They couldn't identify anybody with it. Okay. Well, then maybe I'll re, I'll do a re, like a re-request that, um, because there's all the stuff that you can do with like you know, the public requests and stuff like that, and so. <clears throat> well, well, holy, holy shit balls! All right. Um. I mean, woo! Just spilling the tea. Again, welcome to the transparency. If you just joined us, um, you don't want to miss it. Breaking everything down, trying to make sense of what in the world is in the water in Idaho. Okay. Um, and the Minecraft Mario, Sarah says, BK is guilty as fuck. Absolutely. You want to come and have some fun, Barbie? Let's go and play. Um, I am so glad that people have those type of opinions because I think that just shows me everything I would ever need to know because I'm never the one over here saying Brian Koberger is innocent. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I don't think I've ever have. said that. That's what's amazing is that nobody should be saying he's guilty or innocent because there's not enough to even have an opinion on that. Yeah. You know? What I'm trying to show everybody is, is, well, if these are the officers that are the ones that are in charge of Brian Koberger's, I don't know, case, then I have a huge fucking problem. And this is why we're seeing why all these problems are happening and why Ann Taylor is like, this isn't, I'm not going through, oh, how can I be creative to get Brian Koberger off fucking four counts of first degree murder and a, a death sentence um, by what firing squad? insert Paul Jacobson over there to be one of the shooters. You know, it's, it's mind blowing. This is, I'm freaking fat. This woman, this Emma Fields woman, who's a massage therapist in the area travels around. This is what she's being told. And this goes back to this small town. This is what these people believe. So how do the Moors have a chance? And how can that ever be, how can their reputation ever be repaired? This is irreparable. But the, but the best part is, is the questions that, that lie here are, is where are you getting your information, Emma? Because that's why there's a lawsuit 
okay? Because what she's speaking of is complete and utter not facts. But she's getting this from somebody. And guess what she was told? She was told that Dr. Drake, she was under the impression that Dr. Drake was driving home that night. That Jennifer told her, yeah, he told me that he'd see me in a, in, in a few minutes. What, see you in a few minutes? How could Jennifer Drake possibly see Dr. Moore in a few minutes if they lived an hour and 15 minutes from that place? She's like, yeah, she, he saw his last patient drive off and then told his wife, I'll be home in a few minutes. And then that's when it encountered with this whole, oh my God, someone, sh oh my God, I think someone hit me. Oh my God, I think someone shot me. Oh my God, I've been hit. And then she hears the two different gunshots. And see, the only reason they're labeling that the gunshots happened at 726 and that this occurred at 726 is based off of one person. And that's Jennifer Drake. Because if you actually go off of what Isaac did, check this out. He hears the gunshots. And when he comes out and looks out, remember where the window was? So right here, the truck's, the truck's right here, right? And if you're, you know, walking to leave out and you go shot, shot. But here, um, if you know who the people were, because she called at six. Okay. So if I call it 642 and my husband says, oh yeah, I'm finishing up with my last patients. I got, you know, so-and-so in here. Or if, if the guy that was there, well, yeah, when I was walking out, there was like a woman that, you know, she was like, you know, darker complected with, you know, another darker complected. But when Jennifer calls at 642, she's wondering like, well, how long is this? Because this guy's all like, what the hell? This wasn't supposed to happen. So um, this guy giving a description, how could he possibly give a description of just, the brother when the brother is walking with the sister to come out of the place to get in a car and that they come out this way to come back like around and, and, and leave and they're on they're not on foot they're in a vehicle okay him chasing somebody down to then call the cops well guess what isaac says that he never said any of this what they are reporting that isaac said he's saying that he didn't say any of that they didn't play the 911 call in court. Okay. So she calls at 642. At 717, he calls her and then she says there was a nine minute and 15 second phone call of which she said that only the last 15 minutes was the dead air and that's when it all happened. So when you add that, that's how they get to the, that this happened at 726 when you add the nine minutes so that's why they think that this happened at that time but if he was to actually see these people walk out get in his car to drive around to try to find them and i keep going back to this then what is your 911 call gonna say you heard somebody shoot off a gun you heard gunshots that's what like when you call in and let's say um i'm sitting here at my house and i hear oh my god was that a firework or was that a gunshot you know I call the police and say, hey, I'm not sure what I heard, but it sounded like gunshots. Like versus a 911 call that would say this. Oh my God. I, I, I think there's gunshots. I heard gunshots and I came outside. There was a guy running. And then I went over to buy where he was running from. I couldn't, I got in my car. I tried to chase him down to take a picture of him. I couldn't get a picture of him. I came back to see what was going on by that building that, that I heard the gunshots. Then I see a body laying down, you know, but guess what guys, that wasn't what was said. We don't even know. We don't even know what was said on any of these 911 calls. Well, first of all, Jennifer didn't make a 911 call. Mm -mm. Um, she, and then she slips up and she says, well, it happened at 732. It, and she always says it. Uh, Cause she was looking at her phone and 
because this is what happens. She goes when she says it. So she makes a call at 6.42 p.m. to find out what the hell's going on because this guy's royally pissed. Like, dude, something's up because those people are still in there. They haven't left yet. It's 6.42 now. So she calls. He says, I'm still the patient. I'll call you as soon as they leave. Brian calls at 7.15 p.m., which is crazy because Eldora says that at 7.15, that's when they were walking out. Okay. And so he calls at 7.17. Then they're... And according to the massage therapist, told told Jennifer that he watched them Yes. Leave. Then Emma says that he... Oh, yeah. He said he watched his patients leave. They left. And then all of a sudden that happened. You know, she said that he was getting... He's like... I'm finishing up. I'm closing up. Now he had in his back pocket one of the projector buttons. So like if you're finishing and you're, you know, cleaning up or whatever, like what's in your back pocket, like that wouldn't be in there, but he was finishing and he's cleaning up. Then she tells me that the reason that they were able to shoot him is because they, sh sh they shot at his shadow. What? Yes. Shadow through the blinds because According to the PCA, there was only one shot, you guys. And the blinds they were drawn. The blinds were drawn. There was only one shot. And they could never find any other shots. There was um, there was no blood at the scene because it was all internal bleeding. Um, and, and it was a really good shot because it was the kill shot. So tell me how that happens with, blood, with the blinds drawn. Um, one shot only. Mm -hmm. And so what... Emma was told apparently from Jennifer, the widow, is that they shot at a shadow. They shot at a shadow and that's how they were able to do it. Okay. And when she's describing this, she says that she heard him, the phone fall, he fell, blah, blah, blah. But now the only way that we're able to get when this, um, why they're going off of when they think it happened at seven at 726 Okay, is because Jennifer says that that nine minute phone call, it was only the last 15 minutes that it was dead air. Because then she says, well, yeah, then I was like, I, if I got off the phone, then, you know, I, I wouldn't be still on the phone with him. So if he tried to come to or whatever, but then she goes ahead and she does it. But she said that she only waited like 15 seconds of dead air. I don't know anybody that, that would wait. To, let's do 15 seconds. Ready? Go. Moment of silence. Brian. Brian, what happened? Brian, what happened? Wait, what do you mean you got shot? What do you mean you got shot? Now, I have asked nurses, and I said, how long would, would he be able to talk? Like, wouldn't he call 911 himself? Like, would he just be dead? You know, he internally bled out. Well, how long would he have? Why didn't he call the police? Why, why did she call the police? Well, unless she said, oh, my God, I'm calling the police. Stay on the phone. I'm going to grab one of the other kids' phones. Or I'm going to grab one of my kids' phones. I'm going to grab what? Like, I'll be on the phone with you. Hold on. I'm going to call them. Don't hang up with me. You know, I'm calling them. They're coming. They're on their way. No, because according to Emma, they didn't take her seriously when she called the police. Now, according to Emma... When, yeah, they didn't believe her at first when she said, I don't know, like my husband's like been shot or something. Like he said he was hit. And I said, oh, that's interesting because there was no 911 call. And that's when she says, well, I don't know, maybe she didn't call 911. She just called the police. I said, there was no call, period. Period. But think about this. What I always wondered is, is why wouldn't he call? If there's no 911 call, it's not like he was shot dead instantly and he couldn't speak. So what really was transpiring on the phone during that time? Between Jennifer and her husband. Exactly. Honey, I got it. I, I'm going to call for you. It wasn't Drake that was helping the police. It was more, and that was allegedly from Emma. None of that. That's just complete. That's what she's being told. <laughs> that him and Mick and the coroner. But when have you ever heard of the coroner, the chiropractor, and the judge are all best friends? I didn't exactly. realize that chiropractors are such a big wig in fucking cities. It just was like a big joke. The chiropractor, the coroner, and the judge walk into a bar. 
just fucking crazy shit. So this is being told though. This is being told though to these ISP detectives. And you're going to sit here and tell me that they're believing this shit. Well, I don't care if you believe it or not. Get the forensics, get the photo, get the, you know, the digitals, get the phones, get these cameras and let's do some police work. Right. And then you're going to be able to weed this all out. Hey, Jennifer, you didn't call 911. She's like, yeah, I know I didn't. I told you guys I didn't. Hey, did you call from a landline? Yeah, no, I didn't call at all. You guys called me at 744. So at 744, Jennifer is getting a phone call from bon- Bonner's Ferry. Bonner's Ferry is calling Jennifer at 744. What? So she slips up and she says something about 7.32 and it being, you know, it happened, it, it, it happened at 7.32. She slips up in her interview. Mm. Interesting to me. But I said, well, 7.32, but Isaac allegedly called the police at 7.29. So really, what was Isaac calling the police for? You get what I'm saying? Like, why didn't they play that 911 call if it had anything to do with, but if you think about it, if you heard the gunshots at 7.29, if you bled out, It would take you three minutes. And that's what, did she get like a little text? And how did she know the deed was done at 732? Was she there? Why does Emma Fields think that um, she's like, yeah, she said that he was leaving and that he would see her in a few, see her in a few Bonner's ferry to Coeur d'Alene Hayden is an hour and 15 minutes. Plus Brian wasn't driving home. He stays out in Bonner's ferry. So what the fuck, how are they possibly going to see each other in a few? And then Emma Fields walked that back and she said, I don't know, maybe she just felt like good night. Yeah, no, she didn't even just walk it back. She said, well, that's why that's when they said good night to each other. That's two different scenarios. He's either coming home or they're saying good night on the phone because they're not spending the night together. And now the new twist in this March and May 2023 new broadcast is that Jennifer Drake is sitting next to her daughter when all this happened. Oh, that's right. When she was on the phone with him, when but her she daughter called, was sitting there. When she called her husband, yes. And I think that would be the 11 year old, right? So very, Who knows? Very young. During the time of when he would have been hit, you guys. It's there is going to be none of this. I, I, unless you're talking about a kill shot, dead, done, but that's not what the coroner ME found in the autopsy. Okay. The autopsy said that the gunshot was, um, attribute that was the attributing factor to the death of Dr. Drake. Okay. And because it internally, nicked. it was, it, it nicked the pulmonary artery, artery. and, um, that it bled internally. He internally bled out. Okay. And so I asked doctors, I've asked nurses, how long would that take? Can you talk? Well, yeah, you can talk. But it is a deadly wound. Hitting the it'll It'll, it'll kill you. Yes. Okay. It'll kill you. The person that owned the coffee shop was one of the police chief's family members. Um, but when we want to talk about investigating, okay, where is any of this, you know, the police keep on saying, tell me about this Jacobson guy. Tell me about this Jacobson guy. To this day, no 911 call. Okay, what has the media done in the Idaho 4 case, guys? What have they done? They're trying to get their hands on a 911 call. Since when? November of 2022. Well, this is my um, challenge, okay? I want to see what mainstream media outlet is going to go and get the 911 call of Dr. Drake's murder. Why hasn't anybody went and tried to get that? 
where is the where are these two 911 calls meaning Isaac's and meaning Jennifer Drake's so this is my challenge to all of you guys that are mainstream media clip this part I challenge you to go put in a request you should be able to get it just like the probable cause you should be able to get everything go get the 911 calls and play them on your news broadcast I double dog dare you Play it on a news broadcast. Oh my god. They're not even covering the case though. Except to say the, about the billboards. Two nights ago you played that one video. So go ahead and go and get. So then the other thing that she couldn't understand, she's like when at 744. When she's when Jennifer Drake is getting this call, because they you guys called us, so she calls allegedly the police, but doesn't really call the police. And then she calls her mom, and then she calls Papa. Okay, um, so she calls them, and but then here they call her at seven forty four to say, "Hey, we what's Brian's cell phone number? What's Brian's cell phone number?" And she's like. Why are they calling me, asking me what Brian's cell phone number is? They're saying the sheriff needs it. The medics are there saying the sheriff yeah, needs Yeah, the it. medics are there. She's trying to ask them, well, is he alive? Has he been shot? Is he alive? What's going on? They're not telling me anything like that. They just want to know what Brian's cell phone number is. What? And ISP was like, well, did you ask them what? Like, why would they say? Why do they need it? I don't know. And then that's when I knew that if they needed Brian's cell phone number, like that, that means he couldn't talk like that. He must have been like not able to talk and he was probably dead. But now I ask all of you guys, why would they need Brian's cell phone number? The first responders, the medics are asking on behalf of the sheriff. So why would they need that when they get to the scene? This is a wrap. <laughs> I left you guys with a lot of good stuff. Um, come on over, join Bella. She's going to give you the read here on her channel at two o'clock. Is she's reading the Bloom Part Five um, Eyes mail. of a Killer? Eyes of a Killer. Um, it's on her channel, which is Bedtime Stories. If any of the mods? Could you guys drop her link in there? Um. She starts it at two here, so it's in just like 10 minutes. Oh boy. And it's like a 27 minute read, so you guys will have all of that. Um, put your earbuds in. Put your earbuds in. Um, thank you there. Hey, JJ. So. Thank you, Miss Bots. Um, the best mods ever. So yeah, she's gonna read it to you guys. So she, those of you guys that are, you know, at work and can't like sit there and read a book and work, um, we make sure that we take care of you. So she's got you over there. Um, check it out. And then I will close by saying, hey, Lana, are you gonna hit on this dot situation? <laughs> Is it worth it? Yeah, I may give it like 15 minutes airtime. Um, maybe tonight at nine. So, but again, thank you guys so much on your way out. You have an opinion, make it known, like slap the thumbs up, slap the thumbs down. Uh, like I said, you have an opinion, make it known. Nobody will ever tell you how to think here. We just want to keep the facts pumping. And remember two o'clock there, uh, just 10 minutes bedtime stories with Bella Sweet and salty. Thanks for becoming a member here on this live broadcast. Over and out. Cool. Just want to get your take on it. Yeah, the dot. Dot, dot. Chain, chain, chain. Thank you, Lana. Thank you, mods. Thank you, members. Thank you, subs. Out, out. Peace.